Welcome to the third of the uh, Durkheim suicide uh, lectures. Um, there's going to be a fourth. Well, we're not going to get through it uh, in this lecture. So what we'll do, we'll get through anomy, and then we'll make a decision. Uh, I, I think we'll do chapter six in the next one, the individual forms, which is really the key uh, to the whole book and, uh, and, and really the most important one. So this is still preparatory to really getting to the punch of, uh, of Durkheim's uh, story. So just to review where we've been, right? So, so, in, so Durkheim, in the first two chapters of this book, uh, uh, actually, it's chapter two, uh, two and three, the substantive chapters, outlines a theory of egoistic society. So egoism, uh, morality, uh, uh, demands that individuals have low attachment uh, to the social groups uh, and that they actually have um, something like a... Um, um, you know, weak group identification, right? They tend to identify with themselves, with the self, the personal self, the psychological self, the um, the organ sac, um, more than the group. And that 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 lack of attachment, that detached style, that lack of identification, then leads to um, to relatively high rates of suicide. And in chapter six, he's going to tell us about Stoic and Epicurean forms of that. He claimed that that really is that this form of suicide, egoistic suicide, is due to insufficient society in the self, and that this was contrasted to down here altruism. In an altruistic suicide, you know, the big other, uh, the 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 big other of language and law, the big other of of names and norms, of um, of, of totem and taboo, uh, demands uh, uh, an identification of the individual with the social self. Uh, the homo duplex idea, and that actually crushes or uh, leads the individual um, ego uh, uh, to die, uh, not because it wants to for its personal self and personal ends, but because it must as commanded by the big other. So this is a death from full attachment and full identity with the society, right? Again, I wander off into the snow to die to save my group. I die on the pier of my husband's uh, funeral, uh, and I die in battle uh, to save my society, those kinds of things. So it's really death due to the excess of society in the self. If you had a little less of that, if you were more egoistic or selfish, uh, you wouldn't do it. Uh, recently, Donald Trump was revealed to have said, again, I'm recording this uh, prior to the election of 2020, so God only knows uh, where this is going to wind up, but, but he recently was quoted as uh, saying that uh, that those who he couldn't understand uh, soldiers dying in battle, he thought they were losers and suckers, and um, and couldn't understand altruism. He's a total egoist and can't understand altruism. So so altruism is really a death due to the excess of society in the self. You don't really look out for your individual self. You're looking out for the big other. And that's true. That's typical of a mechanically bonded society, of traditional villages, clans, and tribes. And that modern capitalist society is the land of egoism. All right, now in this chapter, we're going to be talking about this other dimension, this other bond that leads to the integration of individuals in society, and that's the dimension of regulation, uh, rules, and uh, and demands, right? And we're going to uh, basically contrast modern society, which is anomic, uh, lacking a clear set of names and norms to guide conduct, and, and fatalism, which is a world of overstrong infinity of demands, okay? So that's where we're headed with this now. So let's take a look here at some drawings. So, so um, traditional society, we looked at people, you know, throwing themselves into the juggernaut, uh, dying be uh, as widows, right? Uh, because one's husband has died and so on. Um, this, I, you know, I actually made, you know, Durkheim writes about Maiden Rock, uh, quotes Mary Eastman. So Maiden Rock is, uh, it's written in Zebulon Pike's Diaries, 1805. The Winona legend, Winona, Minnesota, is named after the Native American Maiden, who uh, uh, a Sioux maiden cast herself and was dashed into a thousand pieces on the rocks below. She had been informed that her friends intended matching her to a man she despised. Having been refused a man she had chosen, she ascended the hill singing her death song. Before they could overtake her and obviate her purpose, she took the lover's leap, right? The lover's leap. This ended her troubles uh, with her life. A wonderful display of sentiment and a savage. So it's it's on Lake Pepin. I made a pilgrimage here. I wanted to see this. Uh, and so I actually went to Maiden Rock on Lake Pepin and was able to stand at Lover's Leap. Um, and Lover's Leaps are everywhere, right? And they're widely known, uh, taking the Lover's Leap. So here's a, 
uh, a 19th century image of Winona making the lover's leap. Um, here is uh, Maiden Rock itself along the banks of the Mississippi River. You can sail right along it. Uh, and again, like here, I think, I think it's, I think it's here, right? I think is where it was at. Um, yeah, you know, here, here's a better image from this direction. You can clear, clearly see it, right? That you'd, again, you can. Uh, so, and it made uh, you know these lovers leaps are everywhere. These myths of 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 uh, unrequited love leading to people to to jump, um, uh, pretty widespread. I I lived for a while in Johnson County, Kansas. There was a an overlook in a park that apparently was used uh, for a lovers leap. Um, yeah. So so yeah, the jumping from high places to. Uh, uh, because of domestic anomie or because of egoism, because of unrequited love, something like that. Okay, so here, here, so, so, um, here's some other images. So this is uh, 19th century. Uh, I think it's come from the Illustrated Police Gazette. So there's all of these sort of over um, dramatic uh, Victorian era images of uh, of suicides, um, all of women. Uh, so here's a woman who threw herself in front of uh, of a uh, uh, of uh, uh, the wheels of something or other. Uh, these are suicide, death, uh, murder, deaths. A murderer awaiting trial kills his young uh, wife and himself. So these are murder suicides. We're going to always call those, they're always going to have an anomic component to it, probably specific anomie. Um, here's a uh, an insane woman in the woods who was attempting suicide, des uh, deserted by her lover. Um, again, these, these over-romanticized images of women in trouble in the 19th Century, here's uh, an image of a domestic, uh, you know, uh, of a killing, double ki double killing suicide uh, thing. Here is death sooner than the workhouse, um, the pathetic suicide, uh, rather they were about to lose everything economically and rather than lose everything, uh, uh, decided to commit suicide. Again, this is definitely anomie when we get to this. Um, Here's some other images of 19th century anomic suicide, suicide of two young girls who are jumping off of a bridge and committing suicide um, uh, for a variety of reasons. Here's suicide on a wedding day. So maybe this is one of those young men um, uh, with fatalistic uh, suicidal ideation who had, um, he doesn't look particularly young, but anyway, uh, uh, the idea of being... Um, uh, trapped. Uh, this is upside down. This is an image of a young woman, again, jumping out of a building, was going to commit suicide, jumped out of a building. I think she was caught by her dress and then didn't die as a result. But but, uh, but at any rate, those are all images of, of suicide that are very different from the ones that we saw last time. It, so this isn't suicide to serve a social end. This isn't suicide to get honor. This isn't suicide because uh, that, that you're engaging in to preserve the dignity of one's group or name or something like that. You're not doing it because of an over-investment of the group and the self. You're doing it because of, uh, for private ends, for private reasons, for the failure of private ends and private reasons, right? Including the failure of a love affair or the failure of, uh, of, um, um, of, of, um, you know, of, of economic um, and that kind of thing. All right, so chapter five then opens, uh, again, welcome to the modern world. So just as egoism was one of the forms of suicide that were widespread in the modern world, so true is something called anomic suicide. So what is anomic suicide? Well, on page 241, he opens it and he claims that anomic suicide is um, linked to the well-known fact that economic crises have an aggravating effect on suicidal tendency, okay? So when you have a financial crisis and a lot of unemployment, it tends to lead to suicide. And that, so we have to explain that. So, um, so, so economic booms, he argues, also cause suicide. So it doesn't matter if it, you have boom times or bust times, um, you're gonna have high rates of suicide. So the economic disruption of any kind causes it. So the conclusion is that, that poverty, and oh yeah, 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 page 240, Four and five cities um, uh, that lost major spectator event. I'm not sure about that. Page two forty six. Uh, poverty is a permanent condition, right? Is an is an insulator against suicide, like in Ireland, right? That it isn't just mere uh, the state of being poor. It's it's rather uh, it's something else, right? So it isn't poverty. This isn't death due to poverty. It's death to uh, due to a disruption of the relationship between desire and one's ability to realize desire. So like the, the, the young couple committing suicide 
rather than go to the poor house. They're not, you know, they were probably poor anyway, but, but being in a poor house is a disruption of dreams and plans and so on. So he claims that actual just if one is poor and permanently poor, you don't tend to commit suicide very often, right? So, um, so it's a disturbance of the collective order that needs to be viewed as the cause of suicide, not mere poverty itself. So page 246, he gets right to the discussion of unleashed desires and modernity, right? Out of all proportion to means. Um, there's an increase needs. Uh, when you get an increase in needs, it leads to a feeling of insatiable and bottomless. Uh, that, that, oh, yeah, that the sense of, of needs is an insatiable and bottomless abyss, right? That once you get kind of an unleashing of desires in the modern world, you it, it just is never ending. And then your capacity to realize that end is is always problematic. So you get unleashed desires without uh, that are out of all proportion to means, right? So page 250, and he claims that's what anomie is. It's this, it's this lack of regulation of means, right, to ends in a society, right? A well-regulated society keeps means and desires balanced, page 250 means and, and the ends or the desired ends of life. Um, conscience is uh, superior. To, uh, yeah, there's a conscience superior to his own, which controls him in a good society. Modern capitalism, page 253, weakens totems and taboos, unleashing appetites and desires. And that's what he calls anomie, right? So if you go to page 255 in the book, um, that's where we're at here. Yeah. 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 So he's got this again. This kind of this long statement here of of how the lack of integration of of the ends of life, like the desired objects in a capitalist a consumer society, and the means to achieve it, right, is uh, is is out of whack, and that's what causes it. You know, there's an entire kind of downshifted but clear um, theory of deviance, uh, the strain theory of deviance made famous by uh, Robert Merton, that is essentially an extension of this discussion in Durkheim's suicide. That anomie is this, is again a lack of regulation, a, a lack of, of um, equivalence between the desired ends and the appropriate means to achieve it, right? Okay, so... Uh, so huge ambitions are impossible of mass fulfillment. So page 253, you really can't do it, right? Like we can't all become wealthy. Poverty protects against suicide because it restrains appetites and desires. That's 254. So the reason why being permanently poor uh, insulates one against anomic suicide is because one is regulated by the expectation of poverty. One's desires are kept in check, and therefore the desires don't outstrip means. So as long as the means and ends are in alignment or in congruence with each other, you don't have anomie. It's only when you get an unleashing of open-ended desire that uh, that you get this uh, happen. So wealth unleashes, uh, you know, million, uh, you know, limitless desire and demands for pleasure and for power and so on. So page two fifty four to two fifty eight then is one of his. And that's where anomie is defined. It's his analysis of capitalism as such. It simultaneously, A, weakens and destroys the language and law system of society. The regulatory structure gets weakened. B, it ushers in rapid, unending change um, that is really difficult for individuals to adapt to. Um, again, traditions always require a kind of time-worn uh, um, a period of... of uh, you know, where, where sort of the paths, the, the, the ruts of tradition get worn over time and in rapid change, traditions can't stabilize, right? And see that exposes people to appetites, pleasures, and desires that are previously unknown. So this destroys the, again, the language and law, totem and taboo system that regulates traditional society. You can't stay within the ruts that were because that will no longer lead to the ends one expects. And it's very difficult for one to find a new rut, a new way, uh, because of the rapid changes and because you really don't have any language um, uh, or means uh, to achieve the ends that are in view. So this takes the kernel of altruism, the thing inside one, more than oneself, away. So you can no longer have values, a god or a religious ritual or ancestors or something that you're going to sustain and maintain with your desires. Remember way back when we, we talked about, about Freud about two or three lectures ago, and you know at the end of Freud's Totem and Taboo, uh, we get this argument made that what people think they're doing 
is honoring their totem and punishing those who violate taboo. But by so doing, they're also doing the basic economic, social, and political work of society. So they think they're honoring ritually their totems and avoiding their taboos, but in the end, what they're doing in the real is economic, social, and polit political life. And so if you're in a traditional society, you can do that. You can just obey your values, follow your values, and the world's work gets done. But when you step into capitalism, that piece of you of society that's in you, that's more than yourself, can no longer lead you down paths of automatic uh, realization of ends. You can't reproduce your society by following the ways that were, by following the values that had always held the society together. You're forced by uh, failure uh, to try something else, right? And so that causes you then to begin to search around and so on. So it replaces it with restless hunger, desire, and, 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 and sensations, right? So in Marx's terms, the absolute spirit no longer is totem and taboo, but becomes capital, money, and commodity. Yeah, so this is, in many ways, what Durkheim calls anomie is the moment when the world governed by values, again, totems, taboos, icons, gods, um, rituals of, of, of honor and respect and feeding of, of, of valued objects and ends, and of avoidance, of, you know, phobic avoidance of, of, of um, tabooed objects, and that world of values is suddenly replaced with value. The world where one's uh, living labor is sucked out behind one's back such so, and paid a, uh, a wage or a salary, and then one winds up in the market to try to purchase the ends of life. So capital, money, commodity, value, in its three forms, replaces values in the totem and taboo form, right? So that's what anime is. Anime is, is this world um, that, that forces individuals to abandon traditional values. They simply cannot work, right? You cannot um, sustain life. You cannot sustain uh, ec your economic, uh, your household. You can't sustain your community. You cannot sustain life by following the tried and true ways. Value has taken over. Capital has taken over. Machinery has taken over. Automation has taken over. Um, outsourcing of jobs has taken over, right? And so you've lost, and you can't continue. But and but you and so and so therefore you must adopt. adopt. So anomie then is manifested by the death of values, totem and taboos, language and law that constrain desires, passions, and interests. Right. So it leaves the individual exposed to limitless desire, and very uncertain ends to achieve the uh, the desired objects, right? Okay, so page 258, there's differences between egoism and anomie. Egoism is intellectual careers, free inquiry, self-worship, that kind of thing is what egoism is, but anomie refers to industry, commerce, inability to uh, control desires, right? They have a different thing. Egoism is really about identification, and, um, and anomie is really about reproduction, regulatory and ritual reproduction of life. Um, economic, you know, the economy and so on. So, so there's a real difference here in the manifestation of, of egoism uh, and anomie. Okay. Um, okay. So the, um, so an primary anomie refers to the death of language and law, totem and taboo, regulatory structures of, of desire, passions, and interests. You know, the old fashioned systems of, of, of inequality, of, of gender inequality, uh, um, age inequality, racial inequality, the names and norms that govern life. You blow that away and you wind up with anomi, no names, no norms, okay? Uh, no language, no law, no totem, no taboo. Page 259, discussion of domestic anomie. Okay, here we go. Divorce and uh, is, is um, domestic anomie. It's a disruption of the names and norms and language and law that govern private life. So Page 262, divorced persons are three to four times more likely to commit suicide. Um, and, and then page 264, where divorce is common, marriage is, um, is harmed, he says, um, the, because marriage becomes less strong and less moral. Uh, therefore, it's really, this is the same argument made by um, contemporary cultural and political conservatives who argue that gay marriage weakens marriage, um, that no-fault divorce weakens marriage because it opens the door 
uh, to marriage being less constraining. And because it's less constraining, it, it has less sort of certainty, fixity to it, that kind of thing. And it becomes more, um, more anomic, right? Where desires and, and uh, um, are out, right? Uh, um, are sort of unleashed, that kind of thing. Page 266 and 7, women benefit much more than men from divorce. Uh, or in other words, men are harmed uh, more and women are harmed less, in his words. And the cable for that is on page 267, if you want to look at that. So should we do that for a second? So this is one of those places where, um, oddly enough, uh, one of the most liberal sociologists, Emil Durkheim, winds up uh, confirming some of the... Um, uh, you know, some of the belief in, uh, of cultural conservatives about marriage. So, um, yeah, so basically, yeah, that, that, um, in, in, in parts of the world where, um, yeah, where, where, um, yeah, where, um, so, well, I, oh, let's not even go into it, but where, where suicide, where, ma where divorce is common, uh, suicide increases, and um, but it increases less for women than men. So women are benefited from uh, divorce and, and relatively easy divorce more so uh, than men. And again, you look at God, the contemporary conservative movement right now, the men's movement. It's all about really locking into kind of the old fashioned patriarchal family structure. The men's movement in America has really been all about attachment of the male identity to the patriarchal family, as opposed to the women's movement, which has really been all about women being um, uh, fully free to accept non-familial roles and to be identified outside of the family. So it's really weird. The men's movement, the conservative reactionary men's movement is all about the reimposition of patriarchy, whereas the feminist movement has really been about um, um, blowing away uh, the patriarchal family and identifying women primarily outside of, of the family um, structure and the family identity. All right, page 269, marriage is more favorable to the wife, uh, the more widely uh, uh, divorce uh, is. Um, all right, page 270, divorce harms marriage by increasing domestic enemy of the marriage. So that's his ultimate indictment of divorce. So again, a kind of critical uh, view of it. But again, for women, uh, it, <laughs> I guess if you're a man, it's good. If you're a woman, not. Okay, um, so anomic suicides, then page 285, are marked by anger and all of the emotions associated with disappointment. So the words he uses: irritation, exasperation, the notion of, of you know blasphemy of uh, uh, of so on. You know the sense that one has really been thrown out of paradise almost. So anomic suicides tend to be very violent. So the word violent is crucial, um, and violent recrimination. There, so there's two forms: there's general and specific, and um, and the general is where you're, you have violent recriminations against life in general, where you have this, this, this unleashed violence against the entire world. Um, and then number two, it's where it's specific to a particular person or persons, right? Violent recrimination against someone, right? So suicide with murder is almost always a mark of anomie, not egoism. So in, when my students analyze particular cases of, of, of uh, self-imposed violence, uh, murder suicides always always wind up in an anomic uh, category. Page 286, uh, he talks about Chateaubriand's, uh, Chateaubriand's uh, René. Um, I'll leave that out. But anyway, the disease of the infinite, disease of infinite um, uh, is, is always linked to this, page 287. Um, and the egoist is the person who suffers from infinite dreams, whereas the anomic person is the person who suffers from infinite desires. So the egoist, again, gets caught up in this, in this self-reflective mirror of um, thinking about the self and the self-pleasures and that kind of stuff, whereas the anomic person is caught up in the pursuit of objects, desired objects, okay? So this might be experiential. Egoist is experiential. Anomic is object. It's possession. It's um, it's uh, it's object oriented. So it's it's object in the psychoanalytic sense of, of, of attachment to individuals and possessing individuals and having uh, connection to individual others. And then uh, it's also objects in the sense of of economic uh, production and so on. Um, that's my mom calling me of all things. I'll just <laughs> set that aside. I'll have to call her back. Um, okay. And then uh, let's let's end then with the famous footnote on page 267, I believe. Um, I think I've got that memorized. 
No, it's not 267. I didn't have it memorized. Um, it is 276. All three uh, numbers just in the wrong order. So here is Durkheim's sum total of writings on fatalism. And I'm going to lower this down, and we're going to just read it. We're just going to read it and interpret it, okay? So Durkheim writes, The above consideration shows that there is a type of suicide, the opposite of anomic suicide, just as egoistic and altruistic suicides are opposites, right? And it is the suicide deriving from excessive regulation, that of persons with futures piteously blocked and passions violently choked uh, by oppressive discipline. It is the suicide of very young husbands, of the married woman who is childless. So he's claiming that that, 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 that captures that those two categories, those, those strange anomalies um, against a general category of married protection, or married people being protected from suicide. There were those two anomalous cases, young men and then childless women who had higher rates of suicide than their counterparts. And he claims that's both due to fatalism because they have violently choked passions. Uh, oppressive discipline. It's the suicide of very young husbands, married women, and childless. So for complete mistake, we should set up a forced suicidal type. And it, then he makes this odd claim. How uh, how it is so, it has so little contemporary importance and examples are so hard to find aside from the cases just mentioned that it seems useless to dwell upon it. Might be said to have historical interest. Do not the suicides of slaves, said to freak, be frequent under certain conditions, The entire Caribbean was wiped out of human beings. Um, I mean, the genocide was almost total, not just because of the introduction of disease and the introduction you know, of, of violent warfare and death, but because native peoples simply died rather than submit to the regime of slavery, right? I mean, the reason why African uh, um, peoples were brought over in a system of chattel slavery was because um, of the incredible um, fatalistic consciousness of those who are unable to honor their gods, unable to die for uh, the group you want. I mean, honestly, being held a slave in part is being prevented from dying into um, your group. And if you are altruistically oriented, there can be nothing worse, right, than that. So, so, um, so, you know, not being able to care for the people you want to care for, to care for the, uh, the spiritual world that you want to care for, engage in the rituals you want to engage in, right? Not being free to do, so even if you're traditional and really, really locked down into a set of, of rituals and rites and, and, so, and, and, and um, altruistic identity, you nevertheless want to do those things, right? And so being prevented from doing it by um, excessive regulation on the part of slave owners and stuff is, is, um, is, is incredibly difficult. So, okay, uh, all suicides attributed to excessive physical or moral despotism. So again, like, like being held in a concentration camp or being held in prison um, or being, you know, again, subject to, uh, you know, work discipline in like a, a workhouse or something, right? To bring out the ineluctable and in flexible nature of the of a rule against which there is no appeal contrast with the expression animal me which has been used we might call it fatalistic suicide and that's it that's the totality of the writings on fatalism so uh so what is fatalism then it's an in, this is this is what i would argue it's the um what, what, we'll come back to this next time but what's key to it you know you're in fatalistic suicide when you can't launch or sustain desire when you already have a kind of a system of language and law, totem and taboo of, of names and norms that regulate your life and you're suddenly blocked or barred from realizing it, right? And again, like, like, uh, like if, you're, if you're captured um, by others, you're going to be in a system of, of uh, uh, you know, where, where, where your death isn't going to be honor your God. Your death is going to be honoring some other person's God. And if your death is going to honor another person's God, if you're a slave, even your life is going to be all about honoring someone else's um, God as well. Okay, so I think then um, we could, I think I tell you what, I'm going to stop this video there and then we'll start up the next one um, and we'll do chapter six next and then we'll wrap up the book in the next video.